So in the last episode, we took on a fun project to fully automate the blocks which we use for building. We now have Corp, Aegon, Mist, Concrete and Basalt on passive. Building and developing new rooms will be needed for us to achieve our goals and set up the required chemical processing lines moving forward. The Platinum line is the next big chemical process and our medium term goal, but before we can build it we're going to need to tackle some more automation, planning and resource gathering. Hello everyone, welcome back to New Horizons, and between episodes I've discovered something that will change the game forever. <laughs> no, no, I'm playing. That was a bit uh, ominous there, but I have discovered something with uh, some of the processes which we set up in the previous episode. So just for some context here, in the farm, or in the void dimension where we have our farms, which by the way have been going very strong since the last episode, I'm so excited that we have these things running now. And that is thanks to some good luck from the loot bags, which gave us the dimensional transceiver. Come on, Greg Tech, the ender tank. No, not ender tank, ender chest. <laughs> Wait a sec, we, we just got a dimensional transceiver. And that allows us to send all of the crops back to the overworld. One of those being sugar beets, which we extract into sugar and then electrolyze into oxygen here. The oxygen is then sent into main fluid storage in this mega tank, which is now full. And the default behavior on the GT++ machines is to stop when the outputs are full. So if this fills with oxygen, then the machine stops, which is good. That means we don't waste sugar or power processing materials unnecessarily. However, a discovery was made about the mechanics of fluid automation and fluid movement. When I discovered that our polytetrafluoroethylene setup was off, so polytetrafluoroethylene is ultimately made from hydrofluoric acid, which is fluorine plus hydrogen. The main input for this thing is fluorine, which comes from black granite dust, which we can get from blackstone lily. Black granite is then centrifuged into biotite, and then biotite is electrolyzed into fluorine for polytetrafluoroethylene. But this thing was not giving us any fluorine. Despite the fact that we have fluid output hatches on this thing, which in theory should output to fluid tanks in our system, and the biotite electrolysis recipe gives us oxygen, fluorine, and a bunch of other useful dusts here, including alumina. But still, I couldn't figure out why this fluorine tank wasn't getting any fluorine whatsoever, despite the fact that we have a constant flow of crops, and therefore biotite, and in theory, fluorine. After about 50 minutes of testing, I discovered that if you don't have space for both fluids, in this case, fluorine and oxygen, then it will just infinitely cache inside the output hatch, waiting for a space in the system. But we didn't have space for both the oxygen and the fluorine because this tank here is full. We don't want to overflow void though, because that means that this thing would be infinitely uh, wasting fluids basically, and running and just voiding at any excess oxygen, and that is kind of a waste of power. And also apologies for the long explanation, but uh, yeah, things, <laughs> things at this point are getting quite complex. The solution though is a wireless redstone signal. We want a wireless fluid detector cover on the oxygen tank. Frequency 80, inverted. And we're gonna say whenever this thing is, has 61 million and its capacity is 64 million. Whenever it has less than 61 million, it's gonna send a signal to the electrolyzer. We're gonna use analog mode, frequency 80. And this will get a machine controller and it will be redstone on, machine on, and safe mode. And this way we can set void overflow on the tank. And this machine stays off, which means it doesn't waste any of the sugar and produces oxygen unnecessarily. And this also helps with some processes here at chemistry, since this gives us oxygen as a byproduct. And I believe the case, that is also the case in the plat line as well coming up. So that prevents some jams over in this room as well. So yeah, I guess the lesson here is make sure you have space for all of the fluids coming out of the machine if you're using these output hatches to AE. I think that was important to mention early on, however, we have a few other things which we need to address. First is to fix a lack of chrome dust. So I took the tier two rocket out into space and landed on the moon. It's important at this point in the game to keep our miners running to meet the increased cost of all the machines. So I made use of the prospector and went out in search of chromite veins. I searched around and I was looking for a place where galena, quartz, chromite and bauxite veins generated next to each other. It took quite a while to find and I wasn't able to get the quartz in range. 
but eventually we were able to set up our multi-block miner and start collecting resources. We will come back and check on that later in the episode. For now we return back to base to address a few more minor things with existing setups. Firstly, I added drawer upgrades to the storage of the crops processing machines to manage storage levels and void any excess. On the forming presses, which we configured in the previous episode, I realised we could just do all of the AE presses in one input boss and share the interface. Since none of the recipes should have any conflicts, this way we can reclaim some channels in the room, and we also get some interfaces back we can use elsewhere. Oh yeah, I also noticed some of the pure and impure dust were sent away from the ore processing system before they were properly dealt with. Without exception, all of the pure and impure should be sent through a centrifuge before they make their way to storage. So it took quite some investigation to find the issue, but it turns out we were just missing an AND in the filter. It's always the tiny things, right? But that should prevent any pures or impures being sent away from the system before they are properly processed. Yeah, now just to move all of the pures and impures back into the input. Next was a refill of the blast furnaces. The small amount of chrome dust we had was mixed into stainless steel, and that was put into the blast furnaces along with some oxygen, circuit 11. I also threw in some stacks of tungsten steel dust which I had mixed earlier. And finally I refilled rutile on the third blast furnace to process into titanium. And I went around and checked all of the machines in the base once over to check for any maintenance issues. I was surprised to find that nothing had any issues, which was awesome. Alright, so I've been really busy here trying to get things planned out. I really would like to get some building done this episode. However, right now we are going to continue automating in the orange room. I did build the multi-block mixer, which we crafted at the very end of last episode. It is a tiny bit taller than the rest of the machines in the room. Uh, so we've got a bump on top, but that kind of gives it some character, right? Sometimes some asymmetry actually helps out. Yeah, I think it'll be just fine, but right now we're going to do a little game of pin and go. What exactly do I mean by that? Well, the platinum line is what is guiding us right now, so I know for a fact that we're going to need a lot of large chemical reactors, right? So what we are going to do is pin this item and auto-craft everything that we need for this. The main plastic we need for the LCR is polytetrafluoroethylene, which should now be fixed. And if I'm not wrong, we should see a much bigger, oh yeah, a much bigger buffer here on PTFE. And of course we are fluid solidifying it automatically over here into bars and sheets. Checking the recipe for the LCR, we need the two large PTFE fluid pipes, which can be made from the bars in an extruder. And we have had an extruder sitting here for a number of episodes, it's just not plugged in yet. So let's plug this thing in, shall we? Okay, it looks like it already has power, it has an output already as well. In fact, you know what, I've had this chest sitting here for a while, you may have noticed it. And it has all of the different extruder shapes, or most of the different extruder shapes. I think there's one or two missing. So by the looks of things, we already have the rod shape in there. And the rods we also need for the LCR. If we look at the casings, for example, chemically inert casings made in the assembling machine, PTFE plus solid steel machine casings, which are made in the assembling machine, steel frame boxes, and these are made from steel rods made in the extruder with this, the rod shape. So that will be in this interface right here. Let's give this a channel. We will also make sure we name it extruder 
rod, then we'll add tiny pipe, extruder, tiny pipe. All right, let's get this plugged in as well. We might have to split this up depending on how many channels we add. Okay, after tiny pipe, we do also have small pipes, but as far as I remember, there's not actually any need for any small pipes, right? I'm trying to think of a use case for these things other than to use them uh, for their intended purpose, just on their own. But in terms of recipes which require small pipe, it's all of, all of like the Bronze Era machines, and we don't really have a need for those anymore. There might potentially be something I'm missing here, but as far as I remember, we don't actually need to be able to auto-craft small pipes. So I guess we're going to skip the small pipe and we'll go straight on to regular pipe. Normal pipes I know for a fact we use all over the place, and I left the shape in this extruder here. Extruder normal pipe. Yeah, normal pipes are used in every single pump recipe. In the case of EV, it's titanium, for example. LV is bronze. HV is stainless steel. And yeah, I think we will actually split up this Fluix cable so that we can get more off the dense cable. We'll do one off this side and one off this side, since we'll, we'll need to have more input buses on the other side of the machine. Alright, so I went ahead and added a few more shapes. We got rods, tiny pipe, regular pipe, bolts, rings, gears, small gears, and large pipe. There is potentially a few more extruder shapes we might need to add in the future, like for example casing, which are used occasionally. But for now we should see them all in the interface terminal here. Yeah, bolt, gear, large pipe, normal pipe, ring, rod, small gear, tiny pipe. And we can now add our recipe for large PTFE fluid pipe. And we'll do this two at a time since it's used two at a time for the controllers. And pretty much at this point, it's just a matter of adding recipes. Let's test to make sure this actually works. Oh, we already have 14. I guess this is uh, leftovers from batch crafting earlier on. Let's see if this works. Well, that's not a good sign, is it? <laughs> it's immediately stuck. Immediately stuck. Did I forget to plug something in? Oh, the machine's off. What a professional. There we go. <laughs> Output bus is sent into another interface down there, right? Yes, and everything should have a channel. Perfect, and we have 16 large PTFE fluid pipes. All right, so the next one I'd like to do here is the rotors. Used in the large chemical reactor and machine controller, but it's also used in all the pumps as well. Quite similar to the fluid pipe, it takes tin for LV, for example, bronze for MV, steel for the HV, and we do have the option to do rotors in the extruder. However, we can save ourselves 0.75 of an ingot if we fluid solidify. It's 612 litres for one stainless steel rotor, which equates to 4.25 ingots, whereas it costs 5 ingots in the extruder. So 0.75 of an ingot doesn't sound like a whole lot, but trust me, once we start getting to the more expensive stuff, that is all going to add up. And yeah, some machines I crafted earlier, we have a fluid extractor and a fluid solidifier. And actually underneath the extractor, we're going to place an interface. We are going to call this solidifier rotors. That's going to send 4.25 ingots into the extractor. That's going to send its contents as a fluid into the solidifier. Then we'll have to grab the rotor mold, which I believe is in here. I've still been making them in here. Yep, there it is. Mold goes into the solidifier, and that's going to be sent back into another interface just to collect the output right here. So extract to the left-hand side, and automatic output. And that should drop the finished rotor back into the interface and complete the craft. And remember, Applied Energistics doesn't need to get the finished item in the same interface it sent the inputs to. As long as it gets this finished rotor, it doesn't matter where it comes from. But obviously there's no way to split up 4.25 ingots, right? Unless we do some, like add some bolts to the recipe and make up the fluid that way. So we are instead going to do this recipe four at a time. The input is going to be 17 at a time. And this math here should work out. Yeah, because 4.25 ingots times 4 is 17. So 17 input is 4 output. This will go into the rotors interface. And now we should be able to request the item. You know what, I think I forgot to enable automatic output from the extractor. There we go. <laughs> that should have cleared the crafting screen, right? And we now have our four stainless steel rotors. Easy. Let's also give these machines some muffler upgrades. And that is another item off the list. So looking at the large chemical reactor again, we have most of this stuff now, right? We can 
well, we can't make the mortars, but we can craft everything for the mortars, I believe. Uh, let's add a recipe for stainless steel rods in the extruder. And we'll do this like half a stack at a time. Again, most of the actual recipes I'll add off camera. But yeah, apart from that, the main machine controller, we should have auto-craftable almost everything. One thing that all of the multi-blocks in the game share in common is energy hatches. And this is really a big one. Energy hatches are are pretty difficult to craft, actually, all things considered. So how do we make the energy hatches? <laughs> yeah, the energy hatches are uh, quite complex here. Even if you wanted to craft an LV one, it's still a, quite an involved process. And even for our platinum line, we are going to have some LV machines, just because we cannot support a full platinum line at HV or above. Just in terms of the power requirements, I mean, but we are in any case going to have to make the LV, MV, HV, EV and eventually IV energy hatch. IV though takes iridium for the coil and also indium gallium phosphide for the high power IC. Everything from MV and above takes some form of wafer, in this case ultra low power and then low power and then high power or regular power, normal power, <laughs> normal power IC. And that is made in the laser engraver. We have two here in the clean room. We're gonna grab this one. So normally for the laser engraver recipes, we need to do it inside the clean room. We can actually bypass that requirement if we put it inside a processing array. And we've had this one sitting here for a while, but uh, like some of the other machines, it's not currently plugged in. Again, it looks like it does already have power. We have an output on the output bus. All we need to do is give it the input. But it's not just the power ICs that we have to take care of, all of which, by the way, take a different form of lens. So it's going to be very similar to the extruder with the different extruder shapes. So we're going to have to split up the input buses to avoid recipe conflicts. But if we're going to do the power ICs, we might as well do all of the circuit wafers as well. Yeah, I mean, if we take any circuit like the LV one, for example, this takes central processing units made from central processing unit wafers made in the laser engraver. And this is a glass lens. And there are a lot of different lenses, some of which overlap. So I'm going to have to go through and figure out which ones we need. So after going through many different pages of NEI, I came across nine different lenses we need to craft everything at this point in the game. Ender Eye, Ender Pearl, Glass, Ruby, Green Sapphire, Air, Blue Sapphire, Terra and Diamond. All of those lenses got their own input bus and named interface. Alright, so assuming nothing is on the crafting screen right here, we should have... Yes. We should have a successful setup here of the laser engraver. Unfortunately, because of minimum casings, I had to cut two that we kind of need. That being the amber lens and the air lens. The air lens, though, I've put inside the clean room and I've just given this thing its own pattern inside the interface. This one is used for LPIC, which I believe is HV energy hatch, so we need a, f <laughs> a fair number of these things. But yeah, like with the GT++ machines, we can only have so many input buses on this thing. So we have to cut the functionality of the amber, which is used for the socks. System on chips are actually really nice to have, and we want to switch to these as soon as possible. But this is for the ULV circuit. And right now, the only use for the, for the ULV circuit I can think about is the Applied Energistics 1K crafting storages. So it's quite important. We might have to swap these out manually when we want to batch craft those things. But eventually, I think we'll have a second laser engraver here, and we'll move this assembly machine elsewhere. For right now, though, I think we can take off the energy hatch, right? We have pretty much everything else encoded. Wait, no, we don't. Ah, that's right. We're also missing lubricant and cooling cells. Lubricant for MV and LV, and coolant cells for HV and above. So for coolant cells, there's the 60K and the 160K, I think. 180k? Yeah, and you can either do helium or you can do knack. We are going to do the knack because for helium you need a vacuum freezer and we don't really have that automated yet. And the lubricant will come back to it at a later stage. I'm not sure how many of you guys will remember this setup over here, which I refilled recently. This turns creosote oil into lubricant. It looks like it's out of power. At some point we'll have to move that over, but we need to take things one step at a time. It's very, very easy to get overwhelmed here. Okay, so how do we make the knack coolant? Well, it's very simple, and we're going to pass of the fluid. 
I was debating whether or not we should put it all here, or perhaps we should put it in chemistry because it, because it is technically a chemical process, and I have been doing some extra planning here. I reckon because it's uh, in single block machines, we're going to keep it through here for now. But the, the very last part of this is going to be on demand, which is going to be in the fluid canner here. So the macerator we had here before, this is for some patterns. Right now we only have fluix. So we're transforming EV to HV and then HV to MV. <laughs> it's the famous saying again. And then MV to all of these machines here. Distillery, fluid heater and fluid canner. The fluid canner is going to get an interface like so and we're going to call this one fluid canner knack so that's for this recipe here to fill the empty cells with sodium potassium which is effectively knack maybe we should have called it sodium yeah i'm going to call it sodium potassium but we have to actually make sodium potassium right so to do that we're going to supply an interface we are going to ask for sodium dust which we make somewhere don't ask me where but we do <laughs> i think from benzene maybe I don't know. It's somewhere. We make this somewhere. And we are also going to request rock salt here. Rock salt dust. I was requesting some more filters for the item conduits here. So we're going to item conduit from the interface. The fluid here is going to get the sodium dust. Insert brown. There we go. That's going to make us liquid sodium, I think. Yes, liquid sodium. That's going to automatically output to the distillery. Filter again. Insert brown rock salt. Loud machine. But that is a good sign. And this should make us sodium potassium. Let's give it a muffler. Sodium potassium is going to go into the fluid canner. Fluid auto output, right? Yes. And now all we have to do is add a fluid canning recipe, empty cell to filled cell, without the use of the fluid, because that should already be in the machine. So there's the 10k and the 180k. And I think there's also a 260k. There's definitely a, is it 380? 360. Yeah, this one here, we might, uh, might as well also add a recipe for this one as well. It's just higher amounts of fluid and a different version of a cell. So all we have to do, enable input from output side. Auto output and fill the patterns inside. I just tossed something away there. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what I got rid of there. But now we should be able to request the coolant cells. Oh, and it looks like we already have eight. That's okay. We need way more than this. And of course, we're missing the recipe for these things. The empty versions of the 10k cells all require empty cells from IC2, and this is made in the extruder, so I guess this is... It is the extruder, right? Yeah, this is made in the extruder, so I guess this is the first thing we missed. I shouldn't say we, it's just me here. <laughs> it's just me in this factory. But, I mean, you guys are here in spirit, right? Where did I leave that... that mold? I think it's in here. It's in this one, right? For cells? Yes. Alright, one more input boss. One more interface. Extruder cells. Cell. Let's actually do this to make it a bit neater. And now we can add the recipe for empty cell. And in fact, we can use the most efficient recipe here, the polytetrafluoroethylene bar, which we are fluid solidifying downstairs. Gives us four per bar. And then combining that with tin plates gives us the empty cell on circuit one. Now there is a recipe conflict for this though. For the 30k, it's also circuit one. It's just a higher amount of cells. Let's put this one in the extruder. So that means that we have to take that into account and we're going to have to use blocking mode on the assembler and also figure out if we have a circuit one in here, which I don't think we do. This is circuit 24. This is circuit... Oh, this is circuit one and six. <laughs> yeah, we're sharing quite a few recipes in this one. We have to make sure we do blocking mode though. So blocking mode will only send the recipe if there's nothing in the input bus. Although, you know what, that's not going to work because there's an ingredient buffer between here. So what it's going to do is send the send the items, the ingredients for the craft into the ingredient buffer. The ingredient buffer is going to ingest it into the input bus because of the conveyor. And that's going to see that this is empty. And then blocking mode is going to say, okay, well, we can send the next recipe in here. And it's going to infinitely fill up and potentially make us the wrong type of cell. So I think the only solution to that is a, another input bus. And we'll make this one circuit one and another interface here. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're exclusive to these cells, but this one we can use blocking mode on. And it should work because we don't have the ingredient buffer in between. Yeah, hopefully there's channels here. All right, let's test this out. A 60k knack cell. It's going to try to craft the empty cell. So that'll test the extruder. It's crafting. Oh, nice. It finished. 10k cell. That's hopefully in the assembler. 
It finished as well. Not coolant. Please. <laughs> it's so satisfying to get this done, but there's so many steps to this. It's crazy. We're just at the beginning of it. Uh, it crafted. It just didn't go to the output. Is this the wrong way? There we go. Nice. Nice. And we can put all this stuff back. Awesome. Well, that is another few items off of our list, which seems to grow every single day here. For the energy hatches, there's also these coils, but this is just an assembler recipe, which we can even do in that circuit one. So I'll, I'll add recipes for those ones. For the MV and LV, we also need the lubricant. Lubricant though, I've marked out a space for here. Let's circle all the way back to the large chemical reactor though. And the other thing we need for this is the coils. You need at least a cooper nickel coil for the large chemical reactor. And we also need coils for blast furnaces. And I counted it out earlier, we are gonna need at least six blast furnaces for the plat line. So that's gonna be a lot of coil blocks. And energy hatches, right? These also take energy hatches. And Invar for the heat proof machine casing. The Cooper Nickel and Invar is gonna be made in the mixer. And it's taken us a while to get around to this, right? But uh, <laughs> we had a few other things cop crop up. And the mixer also takes fluids. So we've got a dual interface here. Invar or Cooper Nickel don't actually take fluids, but uh, I know for a fact we do actually need this. So we are gonna request water. And the water, just as a reminder, we have tucked away in here with a fluid storage bus underneath. And this is just so we can void any excess that come out. This, this is made as a byproduct. Don't ask me which machine, but I believe it's somewhere in here. So technically there's nothing making us water. Uh, so we might eventually run out depending on the state of the machines in chemistry. But this is the only tank which has a fluid storage bus on. And yes, obviously we could use a reservoir, but uh, I'm trying to save resources, so. <laughs> Just in case I wonder why we don't have enough water in the mixer later on, that is the reason. And I'm sure you guys are going to remind me, but uh, I'll take my chances for now. We're going to live life on the edge. <laughs> oh yeah, we have to request it in the, uh, in the fluid version. We want the fluid water here. We also want to request oxygen here, molten glowstone, and molten redstone. Which of course we fluid extract over here. And in fact you can see the machines already turned back on to fill the buffer. So those fluids are going to be sent from the dual interface straight into a quadruple input hatch, which can buffer four different types of fluid. Very useful for multi-blocks like the mixer and like the blast furnace. We could have used Applied Energistics Auto Crafting, but these fluids here aren't exactly expensive, so it's better, and we already have all of them on passive, so it's best just to passively keep it in the interface, or in the machine rather. And even though it's only a tiny bit, every little helps, and it will reduce the amount of crafting storage, which we need to request uh, certain types of recipes. I mean that and it just simplifies everything over here. So once again, we have the output. We're gonna hide this from the terminal. And then for inputs here, I know there's like a crazy amount of circuit numbers. Cooper nickel, for example, is circuit three, nickel plus copper. And we'll do this like a full stack at a time. Invar is circuit one, nickel plus iron. Again, we'll do it like a full stack at a time. 96 at a time, sure. And you guys get the idea by now, right? This is gonna be mixer one, mixer three, and we basically just scale things from here. These things do give us dust, so we'll have to add a smelting recipe for this as well, which of course will go in the multi-smelter. And since we upgraded to TPV, this does a full stack at a time. I think it was 16 last episode. In case you were curious what the glowstone is for in the mixer, it's for lumium, which isn't technically needed until LUV. We're just planning ahead a little bit. And same for the redstone, it's used for signalium. And yes, there is an I in there. <laughs> I'm not saying it wrong. Yeah, 979 pages worth of dusts. Look at all this garbage here. It's insane. <laughs> so I've got a lot of recipe encoding to do, including things for the blast furnace, like the casings and so on, the heat proofs. But this is all existing infrastructure that we should now have. We have the ability to make plates. We can make Invar frame boxes in the assembler. We can make rods now with the extruder. So yeah, it's really just about adding to the interfaces. And I'm also very curious how much power this thing is. 2,300 EU a tick, just passively on mainnet. And subnet is at 300. That's madness, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, remember every interface we add is passively taking power away from us. And power is almost due for another upgrade, I think. At the very least power storage, because this isn't gonna last us very long. Yeah, you can see here, like, every every few ticks, it's taken away 8,000 EU. 
to power something or, or other. Most of it is probably going to crops processing at the moment, since nothing in ore processing is running right now. I think we're through all of the backlog. So at this point in the game, we still have lots of preparation for Platline. Perhaps the biggest thing looming over us right now is the space for it, because ain't no way it's going to fit here, as we talked about last episode. This space is for polyphenylene sulfide, indium, and a few other things here like distilled water, radon, and lubricant. So we have done a lot of automation this episode. I think it's time for some building. And I have no idea what I'm doing here. We are going to wing it. <laughs> Let's see what I come up with. We need a space for the plat line. All right, so a few hours later, how does this feel? It's important that we get the feel right here. And of course, full disclosure, we are in a creative copy of the world right now. It makes it easy to iterate over ideas. But yeah, how does this feel? And you know what? I think I'm actually really liking this. I really like the use of these windows here, especially from the outside. It's very underdeveloped right now. There's a lot more work that has to be done still, of course. But yeah, this really connects the inside to the outside, makes it feel more cohesive than it already is. And then we also have some decisions on the inside. So just to, uh, for placement here, this is the main room. This is the main chemistry room that we visited like every day, pretty much. I extended it out and I was going to put a staircase right here. I was just experimenting with some ideas. But this presents a challenge for the wiring because underneath this room is a significant amount of wiring. Some might call it spaghetti. But we need <laughs> we need almost the same amount of space underneath the next floor as well. So the ceiling here is going to be the wiring space for the next room above, which is going to be Platline. And the same machines exist here just because of the copy paste of World Edit. The layout isn't going to actually be distillation towers like this. But yeah, the need for wiring kind of eliminates our ability to put a staircase here. So I'm not entirely sure how we're going to get between the floors. I mean, there is obviously this walkway here, right? Which exists from the main terminal. We can go all the way along here. This is parallel to the one below. And this takes us into the new room here. And it starts a little bit back because of this circle. Because of the rocket silo, we can't start it in the exact same place. In fact, I think the next, yeah, right down there, you can see the terminal is right below this block. But obviously that is a bit close to here, so we have to start it a few chunks over, or one chunk over. That does, however, allow us to connect to here. And then we have all of this extra space, and initially the room cut off right here. But I think I might extend it until the end of the chunk. And perhaps we put this corp border right here instead. And that allows us to put the walkway straight through the middle. And then connect up to the existing tunnel, which is which has been here before we even broke ground on the valley. And this connects us all the way to the old section of base. You guys remember this board? Right, this is our blast furnaces over here. And yeah, this is an old copy of the world. We still have TPV alloy coils here. But yeah, you know what? I think we're actually onto an idea here. It's going to be a nightmare to try and get this built in the main world. Because <laughs> pretty much all of the, everything you can see right here I think it goes to like here. It's just solid. All of this is just solid. And uh, working with some curves in here and some intricate shapes is not going to be so easy to dig out. Uh, yep, logging back into the main world. You can see here, I was a little off. But yeah, it's pretty much just solid through here. So we've got a lot of digging to do. And of course the wiring tunnel as well. That is obviously not built either. It has been a couple of hours though and I noticed that we were actually out of benzene because I accidentally left the system off and I think we're starting to backlog again. Yeah, I don't know if that means that this needs an upgrade. I hope not, we just built this thing. <laughs> but we might have to speed the system up in one way or another. Anyways, it is working. And scrolling through a few of these things here, you can see that I added some recipes for all of the pumps, all of the coils, more rods, more pipes. All of the energy hatches also have recipes. Wait, I actually didn't test this. Let's see if we can get an EV energy hatch. I'm pretty sure we can craft this now. Nice, look at this. It's actually working. It's going to finish, right? It just takes a minute. Yes, it took a second. <laughs> I, got, I got a bit nervous there, but no, it did finish. We have an extra energy hatch. Nice. Yeah, things are coming along here slowly, but I think we are going to wrap up the episode right here. I am going to be working on some digging here. I've got a lot to do. So with that, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.